Okay, hello, and welcome to the third day of the ICFP main program. So in this session, we're gonna start off with some reports and some awards. So first up, we have Igor Lukanen, who is gonna give us a presentation about the ICFP programming competition. Oh, everyone, I'm happy to be here on the virtual stage of the ICFP 2020. On behalf of the organizers of this year's contest, I'm going to share our story, our experience, and of course, announce the winners. It all began three years ago, in year 2017, when I took part in the ICFP contest for the first time in my life. I was a part of Team Tech Contour RU, which consisted of many seasoned ICFP contest participants with decade-long track records. But we were also software engineers, as software engineers routinely do. After 72 hours of lambda punting, we've had a contest retrospective meeting. When it was came across of our sleep-deprived minds, what? If we organize an ICFP contest next year, I barely remember sending an email to that year's ICFP general chair, but I surely recall feeling brave and energized. That an arrangement was already made with the next year's organizers. Did it change anything for us? Not at all. Every year, we dedicated our efforts to these 72 hours so dear to our hearts. We did our best to compete and we documented our efforts in emotional write-ups which attracted hundreds of watchers. Things changed when we contacted Ilya Sergei, an organizer of the famous ICFP contest 2019 that once and for all solved the problem of bit rotten legacy helped us to connect to the ICFP organizing committee and remind them about our aspiration to organize an ICFP contest. And suddenly it worked. Eventually, we were trusted with the contest. For that, on behalf of the team of eight people who organized the ICFP contest 2020, let me express our deep gratitude to Ilya Sergei and Stephanie Vairi, ICFP General Chair. I believe that at least one of them thought, hmm, let's see what would happen if we invite some non-academics to organize the contest. Here's how it played out. Our task was super clear, get to organize everything. However, the possibilities seemed endless and we needed a way to reduce the solution space. So, our first step was to think what traits of different program tasks we sincerely liked. Here's the list. We liked reverse engineering and also VM programming and programming language construction. We adored nonlinear structured contests, but also we, we liked the contests with short task specifications. Also, we thought and an everlasting competition to our contests. With these constraints, we got started. Let's explore our design process and see what we actually prepare. And the starting point is the task specification. How do one design a short and concise task specification, which does not require several hours and liters of coffee to get a grasp of? We didn't know, but somehow we got captivated by an even more extreme idea. We could not resist. What if we make a zero lens task specification? What if the formal language theory, a lambda? Once we thought about that, there was no way back. Now we needed to explain things to humans without using any human language. So we had 
it effectively meant we're creating something and there is one more thing as we all know icfp contest has its traditions it is expected that several months weeks or days before the start of the contest some teasers and spoilers are published usually they don't reveal much about the contest but with our desire to create a deep backstory we wanted to try something novel we thought what if the pre-contest teasers would be more meaningful interesting and useful so two weeks before the start of the contest the official account of the icfp contest 2020 retweeted this Hello, I am a staff astronomer at Pegovka Observatory in the Ural region of Russia. We have registered a peculiar radio transmission which cannot be attributed to any natural source in this area. That is why I decided to publish a recording of this message and create a special documentation page online to collaborate on the explanation. So, we invented a fictional character, an astronomer from an observatory somewhere deep in the Ural Mountains, who can barely read English from an antiquated punch card, but is desperate to get help decoding a mysterious radio signal from space. As expected, Ivan Zaitsev immediately gained attention from the participants. Some of them tried to find any clues of the upcoming contest in the videos, and the clues were plenty. Even Ivan Zaitsev's name was a combination of names of two important people. Ivan Dutil is a Canadian astrophysicist who is one of the authors of the cosmic call messages that were sent into space from Yevpatoria Observatory in 1999 and 2003. Alexander Zaitsev is a prominent Russian astronomer who supervised the transmission of the cosmic call messages. Coincidentally, our fictional astronomer was a friend of the ICFP contest organizers. Knowing that the ICFP community is keen on solving mysteries, Ivan Zaitsev set up a collective communication channel on Discord and shared the audio file of the space message. It took just a few hours to get from an audio file to a two-dimensional image that looked somewhat like the Arecibo message. We did not help the participants solving this in any way, and were just watching in amusement how fast they were grasping things. Our astronomer was receiving new messages every day. Participants were busy discovering the meaning of the messages. First, it were integer numbers, but then we had basic algebra, functions and variables, etc. Each message introduced a single using any human language. For example, this image introduces the successor operator. Aliens heavily relied on human ability to generalize concepts, and our participants did not fail. Two days after we published the first message, we had an open source Haskell code that generated annotations for all known glyphs. In fact, some of our chat members were so smart that we were getting rather nervous. Did we disclose too much information about the upcoming contest? Is this a non-intelligent automatic ship designed to find other species? Yes, it is. Are we going to get subtraction, multiplication and division in the next three days? Almost. We'll get variables, multiplications and division. And the scariest one by far was the participants discovering the unlambda, which was very much on the point. Especially the backtick operator, which the aliens even made look like a backtick. Fortunately for us, it went mostly unnoticed. We did our best to keep Ivan Zaitsev's story separate from the contest. But eventually, we needed to connect them. So, shortly before the start of the contest, we issued this statement. Luckily, some participants have already anticipated this plot twist. The pre-contest stage has come to its end, and the ICFP contest 2020 has begun. 
As was obvious to some of our most insightful participants, the whole Ivan Zaitsev story was a setup for the actual contest. Right at the moment when the contest was scheduled to start, Pavel Igorov published a video on behalf of the organizers in which he declared that instead of the planned contest, we'll be helping Ivan Zaitsev to decipher a big message from space. As we all know, a usual ICFP contest starts with a formal specification published in PDF format for every participant to print out and mull over with a cup of coffee. There is no communication between teams as they silently compete to better implement what is described in this document. But we have a zero length spec, don't we? How do we get from a zero page PDF, which is good for the environment, to a comprehensible task specification? What if we make teams collaborate to make one? Right at the start of the contest, Ivan Zaitsev published a whole bunch of new undecoded alien messages. We started to crowdsource the documentation, adding new pages to the Read the Docs site as soon as someone offered a meaningful explanation in the chat. We did not provide any insight on the task nature, acting as if we knew nothing more about the intentions of the aliens than all the contest participants. All the function names, concepts and explanations were crowdsourced and written into the documentation as we dedicated quite some time to the choice of the computational system. We wanted to offer a model of computation which is unusual, but at the same time not very difficult to reason about for a software engineer. Also, not very counterintuitive and possibly not very demanding in terms of a compiler or VM implementation. Our choice was surely influenced by a book by Simon Payton Jones, who is also presenting at this ICFP. At least one and a half members of our team have studied this book from cover to cover. So, alien messages have eventually built up to a primitive yet Turing complete computational system based on integers, S, K, I, B, C combinators and a set of built-in predefined functions like arithmetic and boolean operations or list construction. Some of the most peculiar functions were these ones. Draw, a function that took a list of coordinate pairs and drew pixels on a virtual screen. Send, a function that made possible to send something to aliens using the observatory radio telescope and get back a response. Of course, we provided a convenient HTTP API to make our telescope accessible from all over the world. Interact, a function that made our whole world alive. Having some kind of program that we called an interaction protocol, we could provide a state coordinates of the pixel and get back an answer that contains a new state and requires us to draw something on a virtual screen or communicate with aliens. By iterating on this state, teams were able to run interactive programs that rendered various things on screen according to the coordinates of the clicked pixels. A little over four hours into the contest, when all of the received messages were more or less understood by the teams, Ivan Zaitsev published one final transmission. It turned out to be a fairly large interaction protocol called the Galaxy. At this point, the collaboration part of the contest was over. Teams got working on implementing and running the Galaxy. proved to be a formidable task. We knew that implementing the Galaxy is going to be hard and some teams will inevitably fall behind. To keep these teams on track and let them have fun without interfering with the leaders. Once again, we took a trick from sports, the concept of pacemaking. If you could probably see a person running with a sign denoting time, 
this person is running with a consistent pace to finish the marathon exactly in the denoted time. We were the pacemakers of our contest. We were pretending to try and crack the task with the pace of an average team, publishing our results as we go, in the true spirit of international scientific collaboration. For example, at some point, Pavel Egorov published three videos explaining not-so-obvious aspects of implementing the virtual machine, and later we published a full implementation of that machine in Pseudocode. It was a controversial move. Stronger teams didn't see any problem with that, because they were very much ahead of the pace. Weaker teams found the tips useful because they were able to stay in the game. However, we received some backlash from the teams that were more or less on our pace. They felt uh, that we published results that devalued their multi-hour efforts. One of the most pleasant and desired effects of the lightning round was that many participants took pleasure in learning various new concepts behind functional programming. We also had a pleasure of talking to many people that surely know computer science much better than we do. It was evident that some concepts that we got familiar with only while preparing the contest were a piece of cake for them. Once a team was able to run the Galaxy protocol and render resulting images, they found themselves inside an interactive user interface. Here's how it looked like. Multiple images were best rendered as layers. Here, the topmost layer is white. Clicking on the Galaxy Glyph increases the counter. Eventually, we end up in the Milky Way main screen. You can see a map of home worlds of different races. Looking at humans, we can see that everything is upside down. That's because we crowdsourced our own vertical axis direction. Clicking on the Galaxy Glyph again, we see a timeline of events. Timeline ends at zero, which is now. Negative numbers represent the past. At some point in the past, there are battles between races, and the winner proceeds to the next round. It is an old that unravels up to the current moment. And at some point in the future, the current leader we must prepare, and in order to do that, the Galaxy UI offers us tutorials. A battle with only one participant. In each tutorial, there is a de description or a hint that tells us what to do next. Here, we should click the Galaxy Glyph. Clicking makes the ship move. Ship has a control menu, which is also described in hint section. When we successfully pass the tutorial, a large true glyph appears, and we proceed to the next level. In the next level, aliens teach us how to explode the ship. As soon as our ship reaches the enemy ship, we, we can explode and destroy it. Success! The Galaxy offers around a dozen tutorials. After we pass the last tutorial, multiplayer battles become available. We can create a new game, receive two player keys, share one of them with some other team, and play an interactive battle. That was exactly the way the tournament worked. But that is not all. If you were curious and explored the Galaxy, you could find bonus minigames. Some races offered a puzzle. When solved correctly, it boosted your ship's stats in battle. We also left a couple of easter eggs. Endo from 2007 contest. Hey Endo! We believe that designing the Galaxy UI is an outstanding achievement by our graphic designer Alexander Kramtsov, and we'd like to thank him 
for the effort. To win the lightning round, participants had to go through all the tutorials and score the most points. The first team to crack a tutorial was All Your Lambda I Belong To Us, or in case of this contest, All Your Galaxy Combinator I Belong To Us. It is a long time successful participant of the ICFP contest. But later, in the lightning round, a strong rival appeared. We throw the leaderboard with Team Powder at the top. But were they able to keep their leadership till the end? I'd like to announce the team that won the lightning round of the ICFP contest. Team Powder! Okay, back to our story. Completing all the Galaxy tutorials culminated in one-on-one -on -one battles against some other player. The Cosmic Comics strip suggested that aliens want us to fight in some kind of galactic tournament against the winner of the previous fight. Ivan Zaitsev was naturally nervous. What is the price of defeat? Destruction of the humankind? The best option was not to lose this fight. But how do we choose the best algorithm to fight on behalf of the whole humanity? Luckily, we had a team of experienced contest organizers that set up a tournament system in advance. Of course, playing a distributed two-player game requires an internet connection. Given the large amount of games required to run a tournament and strict timeouts on each turn, it would be fair to run games locally on the ICFP organizer's servers instead of requiring teams to make HTTP requests across the globe. Therefore, teams will need to submit their source code. Being long-time ICFP contest participants ourselves, we knew that making a submission comply with the requirements of the system is usually a pain. Typically, in a contest, a team would build their solution locally, compress the results into a single zip file and upload said zip file through a web form supplying necessary version and authentication parameters. But what if submitting your code was as easy as running git push? That is exactly what we did. We published a set of starter git rep repositories compliant with our submission system well before the contest started and invited teams to clone them. Submitted code was built and run inside Docker containers which ensured predictable and reproducible builds and runs of all teams' submissions. We got very positive feedback for our system and almost no complaints or technical questions during the contest. Of course, some languages turn out to be less convenient for this type of build-run system than others. For example, a camel base image with all the necessary dependencies grew up to be 4 GB in size and required at least 12 GB of memory to build. We actually prepared a separate hardware to build such kind of solutions, which we jokingly called the OCaml build farm. The tutorials suggested an obvious way to participate in battles. One could render the Galaxy UI and click the appropriate pixels by hand. But how would you do this from an isolated Docker container running on an isolated remote server being self-isolated somewhere in Bashkortostan. Of course, you could, and should, reverse engineer the binary communication protocol and skip the graphical UI part. But what if you were too stubborn and stuck with the idea of automating the clicking process? What if you submitted a click bot that could render the UI, detect ships and clickable areas on the image and play games this way? As far as we know, only one team tried this approach and had noticeable success with it. I am glad to announce that this team, the Wild Bash Court Mages, receives the judges' prize and the right to call themselves an extremely cool bunch of hackers. Let's get it, 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 let's get it
Obviously, we strived hard to make the tournament fun to play for the overwhelming majority of teams which have sticked to a more conventional way to participate in Space Wars. Every team was able to control which version of their algorithm takes part in the Space Wars at the moment. Naturally, every battle was readily available to be replayed and thoroughly investigated via a web-based visualizer we provided. Feedback from the participants have indicated that it was absolutely right move. We went even further than that and launched the Tournament TV, a publicly available live stream on Twitch. It looped through several dozen replays of the most advanced algorithms submitted so far. But was the Tournament TV really fun to watch? As seasoned participants of competitive programming contests, we were fully aware that teams would go to great lengths to withhold their best algorithms and put them into play only in the final moments of the tournament. This, this would effectively lead to less competition and less fun during the contest. It would also make the TV replays boring. What if we find a way to force the participants to submit their best work early? We decided to split the tournament into several rounds and require a submission to be made for every round. Thus, each team's score would be calculated as a cumulative sum of scores in every round. As you probably have guessed, we proudly borrowed this approach from sports, namely from the Biathlon World Cup. To assign scores in every round, we needed to rank teams. However, we could not afford to play full rounds due to the computational complexity of such approach. We needed a tournament scheme that takes less rounds to determine the standings. Typically, some classic scheme is used, like a single or double elimination system, or a Swiss system. But what if we chose something modern? A tournament system that gives precise results while not requiring a large number of rounds. We chose a true skill-like ranking system. It was developed by Microsoft Research and proved able to track the skills and match players in massively multiplayer online games. However, the incorporation of true skill brought a little bit of complexity to the leaderboard. Suddenly, the players would need to be aware of the Bayesian inference algorithms of Mu and Sigma. Using this system, we were able to determine the rankings of the teams and with that, I'd like to announce the team that ended up second. 
Team 18 2020. Hello everyone, we are the team 18 2020. It's a great pleasure to get the second place. So I'd like to talk about our experience and the solution. First, let us introduce our team. We are CS graduate student at the University of Tokyo. 18 in the team name means the year when we enter the faculty. We used only C++ because C++ is the language which all team members are familiar with. We used OpenCV as a DUI framework. Let us talk about our result. Lightning division was really hard for us and we could get only two points. Most of the work that was done by Wang and without him, we would have even up the contest for sure. Um, for the full division, as you can see it, our full round result was not so good. We could have won second place in the stage six, but we are totally surprised to hear we got the second place at the final. So now we want to talk about our strategy in the game. We use the split command for both attacker and the defender. And what a ship sequential rail repeats, creating a tiny ship and moving to another orbit. We tried to split our ships recursively, but we couldn't make it on time. I guess many teams take uh, splitting based approaches, but the different point is the parameter max fuel burn speed. We set it to two. So we can choose acceleration vectors from 24 directions. The good point of this setting is that we could create different orbits easily and it makes hard for opponent to predict the next position. So let's take a look at our attacker. The color of our team is yellow. The mother ship creates ships with one fuel. It's important for children's ships to have a fuel. The power of explosion differs a lot. Ships explode if they, they are more opponent in the explosion range. Let's look at defenders as well. Our team is blue. The mother ship splits into 70 to 19 ships and just run away. The mother ship has emergency avoidance functionality. I mean, if there is an opponent which can fire a laser and is in a good laser position, the mother ship moves randomly. In summary, attacker uses split and explosion based method and the defender uses speed and run method. Thank you for listening. After the end of each round, we played enough games so teams through skill ratings would settle. And after that, the scores were assigned according to a formula. As always, there is a catch. Being a probability-based ranking system, true skill doesn't guarantee that we get a strict ordering of teams. Indeed, Given the random starting parameters of the battles, we can find ourselves in a situation when we could not define the rankings with certainty. This is exactly what happened with the second and third ranking teams in the final round. And that's why I am glad to unexpectedly announce the second team that also won the second place prize. Team Unagi. As there is the only team left to be announced as the winner of this contest, let me briefly flick through a few numbers which are relevant to all teams. There were more than 500 teams registered for the ICFP contest 2020. Obviously, this number was affected by the early pre-registration and starter kit testing. However, 
We must acknowledge that many prominent organizations and individuals were so kind to help us spread the word about the contest and attract new participants. And for that, I'm deeply thankful. Actually, we collected a lot of feedback and opinions from the participants, because feedback service is definitely a thing, among other things, that software engineers like us excel at. This helped us understand if we have really reached what we strived for. Well, mostly. However, some things certainly slipped through our fingers, and we humbly acknowledge this as well. That being said, I'm ready to announce the team which have performed perfectly. Please welcome the winner of the first place prize, Team Closed and Restricted Boltzmann Machine. Hi, ICFP 2020. This is the closed and restricted Boltzmann machine team. We are five software engineers with a passion for mathematics. Today, we'd like to present you our solution for the ICFP contest problem. A few words about the way we participated. As probably most of other teams, we work 100% remotely using GitHub as well as video and text messengers to communicate. Our solution is written in Python, and we also used a little bit of C++ for quick prototyping in the lightning round. The goal of the main round was to implement a strategy for controlling a fleet of spaceships fighting on a two-dimensional map. In each game, one team is an attacker and another is a defender. The goal of the attacker is to destroy the defender's fleet, and the defender is trying not to be destroyed in the predefined number of time ticks. Here you can see our strategy playing against itself. The overall approach is to create a large fleet of small ships, which we call Swarm, together with one ship that can use a laser. The small ships would self-destruct and try to kill enemy ships with the explosion. The key point of our Swarm strategy is to use a pre-computed set of trajectories, which don't require any fuel for the ships to stay on. A large swarm of weaker ships flying on such orbits can destroy enemy ships with self-explosions. Since the enemy has ways to hide from our swarm, we also create one stronger ship with a laser that would be able to attack such enemies from a distance. In order to maximize the laser damage, we want to precisely target the enemies. We compute the position of an enemy ship on the next step using its current location and velocity, gravity, and also try to predict if the ship is going to use the engines based on its previous behavior. We select the target for the laser using a simple heuristic then. Many weaker ships will also receive a little bit of fuel and they can use it to slightly adjust their trajectories if it is possible to intercept an enemy ship. Then we choose if we want to explode them using another heuristic. In this replay, the lines show the future trajectories of the ships if they don't use any additional fuel. Here is the critical step for our strategy when our ship, this one, is using its last unit of fuel to adjust its trajectory so it can intercept the orange ship and win the game. Notice how on the tick 100, the trajectory of the blue ship is close to the orange one, but not close enough for the intercept. But on tick 101, the trajectory is adjusted. So eventually the ships get so close that the blue one can destroy the orange one with an explosion. And that pretty much summarizes our strategy. In the end, we would like to thank the organizers for this very unusual and interesting contest. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the ICFP. Probably strive to create something that we ourselves would love. A contest designed for a better, for a perfect version of our own team. We tried to fix things from past contests that we considered broken. We looked for things that we love and tried to magnify them as a thousand times. We took a risk to change things up and we made decisions not everyone liked. But we also made decisions that people loved. Personally, I hope you had fun participating in the contest and listening to this talk. I also hope that we made at least a small but lasting effect on the ICFP contest as a whole. 
that future contests will be better organized and more interesting than ever before. And now we are almost ready to wrap up. I want to thank everyone who have contributed to this contest and helped us bring it to life. Thanks to the ICFP organizing committee and especially to Ilya Sergei and Stephanie Weirich. Thanks to the team of my fellow organizers, as well as many people who were involved in playtesting and creating an appealing visual for the contest. And of course, I want to say thanks to all the participants. We have created this contest for you, and we await to stand with you shoulder to shoulder as the participants of the next ICFP contest. Again. And that is all. Please behold the three-dimensional visualization of the final battle between humankind and the aliens. And after that, we'll be ready to answer your questions. Thank you, Igor. That was a really fantastic presentation. And I want to join the rest of the organizing committee and thank you once again for putting together such a great contest. So <laughs> I know it's very hard to congratulate over Zoom like this, but, but please accept my appreciation for- Thank you so much. It was, it was a pleasure on our side to be the organizers and uh, we'll be even more happier than before in joining ICFP contest next year. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so everybody watching, I want you to know that Igor has agreed to stick around after this pre after uh, this presentation is over right now at um, 9:45 and he uh, Eastern time, and he will be in the Q and A Zoom room one to answer any questions that you have. <clears throat> about the programming contest this year. I also want to add my thanks to all of the teams that participated in the contest. Um, having a, a, a huge group of people come together, all work on the same problem at once is one of my favorite parts of the programming contest. And I hope every one of you have enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed the programming contest in the past. So thank you again. And um, please join Igor in the Q&A room. In just a minute, we're going to start the second part of this session, which is our presentation of some SIGPLAN and SRC awards, as well as some reports from our SIGPLAN chair, our program chair, and an announcement about ICFD 2021.
Okay, now welcome to the awards and report portion of the session. So we're going to start with some awards by uh, that will be presented by Mira. She will be giving the SIGPLAN awards. Uh, Stephanie, I, I don't see the slides, but uh, nevertheless. Um, do you hear me? Everybody hears me? Yes. Okay, so um, I'm doing this in my role as uh, a member of the SIGPLAN Executive Committee, responsible for, let's say, roughly half of the awards that SIGPLAN gives every year. Um, these are partly so, I mean, these are the most influential paper awards, which are specific to a conference, and then there are some other awards that are for the whole ZIGPLAN. And we have today um, two such awards to announce, um, one of each case. Um, and I guess I will start with the Distinguished Educators Award, Stephanie, because I don't see the slides for some reason. I, I think I'm having a little problem with my share. Let me just start this again. Okay, um, now I see. Okay, great. Thank you. So as you see, so um, ACM Zigplan uh, Distinguished Award 2020 goes to Benjamin Pierce. Um, this award recognizes the value and the degree of service of our community members uh, to programming language educations. And I don't, I don't need to say much um, um, to explain why Benjamin is uh, uh, receiving this award. He is an exceptional um, uh, educator and mentor in programming languages. Um, I mean, you see a couple of uh, his books, the Types and Programming Languages uh, book and the follow-up advanced topics in Types and Programming Languages are kind of the standard book for um, educating PL researchers um, and all his activities and books are inspiring not only to students but also to us teachers to give you a kind of a detail. I mean some of Benjamin's students uh, was visiting us in my group and when he mentioned that he did his PhD with Benjamin one of my PhD students said the Benjamin? Do you mean the Benjamin? So he had been uh, Benjamin, for, for my students, a very, very important um, person in educating them for PL research. But these are only the two books. More recently, he has moved on with the Software Foundations uh, series, which is an uh, online um, a series of um, 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 topics on foundations of um, programming and uh, software. And then he's also a great mentor. Um, giving a lot of support uh, to PhD students all over the world. And uh, on the slide, you see, for example, the deep spec uh, summer school, the, 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 Lego, the, the logo of the summer school. Um, and there are quite some more activities. So more, more than deserved this uh, award. Um, at this point, uh, I would like to congratulate Benjamin and I hope that all of you will join me in congratulating him. And I assume Benjamin wanted to say something now, uh, Stephanie, or should I move on with the other award that then Benjamin talks? What's I think the... Benjamin can say a few words uh, right now. Yes, I would love to say a few words. Um, are you hearing me, Stephanie? I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, I am super excited by this and, uh, and also deeply honored and humbled. Uh, in a community with such amazing educators to, um, to be recognized in this way. So thank you very much. Um, uh, I have a whole bunch of other people to thank, far too many for the time that we have, but, um, but I want to particularly recognize a few. I want to recognize uh, the people that taught me to write. There were a lot of them, but I think I learned the most from Don Knuth and from John Reynolds. Uh, I want to acknowledge the developers of the amazing Cox system uh, that is the foundation for the Software Foundation series and so much other work that's going on in the programming languages community at the moment. 
Um, I want to acknowledge all of my co-authors and collaborators, especially on the uh, the most recent Software Foundations effort, which really is is less like a traditional book and more like an open source software project uh, with contributions from many, many, many people um, and not just small contributions. Um, and lastly, I want to, uh, I am very excited to make an announcement uh, that we have just today made a major release um, of volumes one and two of the Software Foundation series uh, featuring huge improvements in particular in the concrete notations that we're using for Horologic and Lambda Calculus. And even more importantly, I would like to announce a brand new volume of the Software Foundation series called Verifiable C by Andrew Appel and Chinchong Kao. Uh, so you will find those on the Software Foundation's website. You can also look forward over the next few months to yet another new volume uh, that's coming probably later this year and more in the works. Thanks, everybody. Stephanie, we move to the next. Okay. Which you have probably done now, not yet. Yeah, uh, it, it came too fast. So, um, the ICF is ICFP Most Influential Paper Award 2020 um, goes to the paper Abstracting Abstract Machines from 2010, um, a systematic approach to higher order program analysis. Um, by David Van Horn and Matt Might. Both of the authors are here and will, uh, at the end, say something to us. Um, the committee, we, we, we had a hard time <laughs> deciding because uh, there were um, a couple of um, influential, very influential papers uh, on uh, the list of ICFP 2010 papers. Um, so at the end, the committee decided, so it was a tough decision for abstracting abstract machines because of, uh, uh, and we can move to the other, uh, to the next slide, Stephanie, um, because of the um, influence that this paper had on um, the way um, static analysis were developed for a couple of languages, Erlang, JavaScript, etc. Um, the influence it had on many researchers who worked on sound static analysis because the approach gave them all the systematic way to go from high level program semantics to a non deterministic finite state machine that can be implemented efficiently. Um, and the, uh, the paper showed actually that this works for a wide variety of language constructs and also demonstrated how careful choices led to analysis with polynomial time complexity. Um, so being this kind of foundational work for a lot of follow-up work on static analysis was kind of um, the, the, the thing that make, uh, make us decide um, that this paper deserves the most influential paper award uh, for 2020. And uh, Matt and David won We'll, we'll say some words about uh, uh, this award. Uh, thanks. So first, I'd, I'd just like to say that both Matt and I are deeply humbled and grateful for this recognition from the ICFP community. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to start by repeating something I, I first heard at ICFP in 2010 from the recipients of that year's Most Influential Paper Award, which is, I'd like to thank the ESOP program committee for rejecting earlier versions of this work, uh, in part because it means uh, Matt and I are now get to be a part of this longstanding tradition, uh, but more significantly because it meant I got to be a part of this work at all. Uh, Matt had authored the ESOP submission and sent it to me afterwards, after the rejection, asking if I wanted to try and, and push it forward, which is a, a very generous offer on his part. And it gave me the opportunity to, uh, to tear it down and, and rebuild it from scratch. And so I'm, I'm forever grateful to Matt for inviting me to do such a thing. But um, more seriously, um, ICFP has always occupied a special place in my mind. Uh, when I was just starting out pouring over papers motivated only by curiosity, so many of the papers that really spoke to me and sparked my imagination appeared at ICFP. Uh, as someone just starting out, the thing I wanted to do more than anything uh, was to be a part of the conversation 
that was ICFB. Uh, I was lucky enough to have two uh, fairly obscure contributions to that conversation as a graduate student, but this paper with Matt, uh, which was one of the first papers I worked on after graduating, was the first time that I had the experience of writing something that, that people seem to really uh, enjoy and appreciate and connect with. Uh, as a researcher, I, I felt heard. I felt like I had some value to offer to the conversation. Uh, it was a deeply fulfilling experience to have the work received that way. Uh, I'm not sure that I would have made it this far without that. So thank you. Uh, and I just want to add that first, yeah, David is far too kind with his credit. I can say unequivocally that the ESOP submission deserved to be rejected. Uh, it was a good idea, but it was also a terrible paper. So it's a reminder uh, too that as scientists, we don't publish ideas. We publish our best approximation of an idea as encoded in a paper. And this idea that you could systematically pull the abstract semantics out of a concrete semantics was something that I bumped into as a graduate student as I made this transformation manually again and again. Uh, fortunately, my advisor, Olin Shivers, has left me with some enduring wisdom, which is that whenever you find yourself doing the same thing over and over, you should replace yourself with a shell script. Uh, so I ended up literally creating LaTeX macros to convert my concrete semantics directly into abstract semantics. And as a struggling pre-tenure scientist, uh, the significance of this discovery was obvious to me immediately because it meant that I could write and submit papers twice as quickly as before. Um, it was David who, though, who really took this rough precursor to an idea and showed just how general and elegant it could be. And it really surprised me when I saw what he did with it and how far he took it. And, and frankly, it's shocked me to see what others have ended up doing with this idea as well, applying it to languages with far more semantic nuance and complexity than the simple abstract machines in the paper. So it, it's really humbling to have one's work recognized this way. And even more so for me, because a few years ago, I was sort of drafted by force out of programming languages and into a completely foreign scientific realm. Uh, but programming languages will always be my first scientific love. And to see that you know, this work here is remembered and applied and appreciated is um, certainly among the most satisfying moments I have ever had as a scientist. So to all of you in the ICFB community, uh, I am truly grateful and I will always feel at home here. Thank you. Great, thanks to both of you and congratulations to all of our SIGPLAN winners. Um, so next up on the schedule, we have Yu Yu Kong, who will be presenting the results of our Student Research Competition Awards. Yu Yu, are you here? Yes. Um, do you hear me? Yes, we're here. Please, please continue. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to give a short report on the first virtual student research competition at ICFP. Next slide, please. But the competition, often called SRC, consists of three rounds, abstracts, posters, and talks. In a physical SRC, the, the poster session is a big social event and happens during a welcome reception of the main conference. Uh, next slide. In a virtual SRC, we don't have a real hallway with posters, nor do we have welcome drinks. So we have to do some additional promotion to attract people's attention. And the next slide shows what we did for this year's SRC. Yes. So we created a playlist of lightning talks, sent an invitation to the ICFP review committee, and even mentioned posters in the ICFP song. And I'm happy to report that the virtual SRC was successful. When I visited posters, there were crowds of people and many interesting conversations going on. So I would like to thank all the attendees. Next slide. I'm also grateful to this wonderful selection committee consisting of Jesper Cox, Stephen Chan, Josh Cole, and Sarah Omar. They all worked really hard to help me run this virtual competition. Thank you all. Next slide. So this year we received eight extended abstracts from students in Asia, Europe, and the US. We selected seven of them for poster presentation. And since everyone did a fantastic job, we invited all the students to give a talk in the finalist presentation session. And now we are coming to the most exciting part of this report. Next slide. 
So let me first announce the winners of the undergraduate category. Third place goes to, next slide, Zhi Pan for her work on type hole inference. And second place goes to Christopher Lam, who presented semantics for a simple differentiable language using distribution theory. And the overall winner of the undergraduate category was James Lowenthal, whose entry was on certified optimization of stream operations using heterogeneous staging. Congratulations. And next, we move on to the graduate category. Next slide, please. In third place, we have Kai Oliver Prot, who presented a GHC plugin to compile effectful languages. And in second place, we have Sunil Sarswat for his work on certified double-sided auction mechanisms. And the overall winner of the graduate category was Cesar Constantin Andritzi, whose entry was on gradual enforcement of IO trace properties. Congratulations. Next slide, please. Uh, so what's going, on, uh, going to happen is that ACM will ship a charming medal to each winner once they return to the office. And in addition to that, the Journal of Functional Programming will offer a second certificate to all the winners. Okay, so let's give a big round of applause in a visible form to everyone who participated in the competition. Thank you. And thank you, Yu Yu, for setting up the competition and having to, and putting it all together. I'd like to also offer my congratulations to all of the participants and winners this year. Next up, we have Jens Palsberg, who's the SIGPLAN chair, and he's going to give us a brief report on the state of SIGPLAN. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jens, and uh, you know, SIGPLAN is the umbrella over uh, all the, the SIGPLAN conferences, ICFP and PLDI, Purple and Splash. And um, before I begin, let me just say, Stephanie, many, many thanks for organizing this uh, fantastic virtual ICFP. Uh, the, I think the surprise for all of us is that being general chair of a virtual conference is much more work than being general chair of, of a physical conference the way we used to know them. And it's just fantastic. You pulled it off and, and um, I have enjoyed participating uh, so much and it's, it's just great. Um, of course, it's already our second virtual conference in SIGPLAN this year. We had, we had PLDI, we, had, uh, we have ICFP, we're going to have a virtual splash coming up in November. And um, of course, SIGPLAN is here to coordinate and uh, let's hope we can keep it going. So you suddenly set the bar very high as did Ali for PLDI in June. Uh, so, so let me just say that uh, the publication process continues. So uh, we already did a good job for, for Splash and, and, and Popple and ICFP to, to disconnect a little bit the publication process from the, from the process of having a conference. So we have, a, we have PAC and PL and SIGPLAN continues to pay for the publication process. So all the papers will, will end up looking good in PAC and PL. And, uh, and SIGPLAN pays for the gold open access so that truly all the papers are gold open access. So I know that ACM is working on uh, eventually having everything be gold open access and be uh, consistent with plan S in Europe and everything. But until the final dot has been made in that story, uh, SIGPLAN will make sure that we pay for gold open access for everything. And so of course, SIGPLAN does many other things, not, not, so, not so many as we used to. So uh, we, we, uh, when, whenever we have physical conferences, we pay for student travel, we pay for students to attend summer schools and, and uh, we, we have supported summer schools on most of the continents 
Uh, and uh, maybe one day we'll go back to having summer schools in person, but so much virtual going on until then. And of course we give awards and you saw a mirror give awards today. There will be more awards coming up at Splash. And so SIGPLAN is still here and making sure everything works. And many thanks to, uh, to, to all the conference people, including Adam for putting together a good program for ICFP uh, yet again. I just want to say a few more things of what's going on. Uh, uh, just about every year we have more sick plan people being honored uh, by being elected ACM fellows. This year uh, I, I went through the list. I, I noticed Saman Amarasinghe, Emery Berger, and Matthew Dwyer, who are all have had many papers in sick plan conferences. And uh, I uh, always cross my fingers that we will get more for next year. So, uh, um, uh, be sure to nominate people for the, for ACM fellow, uh, particularly for the ICFP community. Uh, so, uh, so let that be a, sort of a message to all of you. Send in nominations. And then uh, one final thing, uh, the Hubble papers are out. Uh, we have a whole bunch of, of um, languages covered there. Of course, Hubble 4 was supposed to be uh, this year. And then um, as it happens, the, pr the preference of the organizers is that Hubble will be in person. So we're kind of uh, waiting a little bit, but let me just notice that many exciting languages are in there. Closure, Emacs, Lisp, we have Groovy, we have F Sharp. Uh, one of my favorite papers in the batch is actually the one about MATLAB and, uh, and many more papers to go with it, standard ML and the list continues. Uh, so. Um, Yet again, uh, Hopple is celebrating all the languages in our community. And as you can see, many functional languages among them. Um, so, uh, okay, so that's my report on, on SIGPLAN. SIGPLAN is going strong and uh, we are uh, looking forward to a future where we can all meet again. And thank you. And thank you, Jens, for your strong leadership for SIGPLAN during this uh, rather challenging time. Um, so up next, we have Adam Chapala, who's going to give us the program chair's report for ICFP 2020. Okay, so as some of you might be able to guess, the ICFP experience this year was, was really divided into two phases. One that was business as usual, just repeating the system that's worked so well for, for many years. And then the other was, oh, this is new and frenzy of activity figuring out completely uh, different approaches. So I'm going to go relatively quickly towards the more tradition through the more traditional program chairs report content. You'll be able to watch this video on YouTube afterward and freeze frame on particular slides and see the details. And then I'll try to get to the the more distinctive part quickly. So let's go to the next slide. Here is our timeline of submission and reviewing and finalizing papers and all that. There's nothing very unusual about it, I think. So I'll come back to this later if you'd like to remind yourself of it, but let's go to the next slide, please. One element that is not new this year, but is new over the last few years, so I'll briefly mention it, is that uh, the articles that are constituting ICFP this year are published in PAC and PL, a relatively new journal, uh, established for this purpose, used also by Uppsala and Popple. Uh, ICFP 2017 was the first to use it. You might have noticed all of the, the ICFP papers are, are available freely, open access online, and that's a practice we hope to see continue, and that's partly thanks to financial support from SIGPLAN as well as authors of individual papers. And this, this process, uh, but using PAC and PL, made ICFP shift to a more journal style of reviewing where there are, are multiple rounds and a, a chance for authors to address required revisions that come up in earlier rounds. So let's go to the next slide, please. A bit more of that shows up here. This is a standard kind of template slide. I'll fill in the numbers for this year. We, we had 101 submissions. As I mentioned, we had a, a two-stage reviewing process and more in the journal style. So the, the first set of decisions were 37 conditional acceptances then the authors had a chance to revise based on the requirements. And I'm glad to report all of them were able to meet those requirements and be fully accepted in the end. The reviewing was done mostly by a program, program committee and an external review committee. Each program committee member did about 10 reviews and there were 16 people there. Then there were about 42 
I guess exactly 42 people on the external review committee doing about four reviews each. I was aiming for about three reviews per paper and at least one expert review for each paper. And then this was achieved in almost all cases. All right, next slide, please. I will highlight a few differences from say ICFP five years ago. Uh, first one was copied from last year. We had an entirely online decision process, no in-person program committee meeting. Of course, when we, I made this decision, it was motivated mostly by environmental reasons and logistical simplicity, but as travel became very difficult, at just the moment everyone would have needed to converge somewhere for an in-person PC meeting, I was very glad we made this decision. Uh, Traditionally, SIG plan requires papers submitted by program committee members meet a higher standard. And when there's an in-person PC meeting, often this requires not letting PC members review each other's papers because we're worried something might be awkward at the meeting. Because we didn't have a meeting, the standard could be different here. It was purely online discussion. And we just required that PC, basically for PC submissions, the tie of what to do with a controversial paper was broken in terms of the conservative choice of not accepting it, whereas by default, we tend to be uh, leaning positive there and, and accepting those with both strong supporters and detractors. I also applied an idea that I, I first learned in the Popple 2012 program committee of among the reviewers for each paper assigning one guardian who has a slightly earlier deadline to finish the review, well, maybe not slightly, sort of in the middle of the review period. I tried to choose someone who was likely to be an expert and then as each of these guardian reviews came in, we could do a little check in and see, do we think we have the right expertise on the program committee for this paper? You might have needed to read the paper to be sure whether you know enough or whether someone else on the, on the PC whose work you know knows enough. If not, then we have a decent amount of time to request an external review and not rush that in the, the last week or so. So I think uh, this practice also worked out very well and I would recommend it for future editions. All right, next slide, please. So uh, this would be the point in the traditional in-person report where I give you a list of the program committee members and we spend several seconds clapping for them. Uh, not gonna work in this medium, but boy, do they sure deserve some applause dealing with a variety of professional and personal challenges as the world got very different than the one when they'd signed on. But we, we got all those reviews written and I'd really like to thank this group of people as well as next slide, please first of several slides listing the external review committee who wrote fewer reviews, but were more likely to be precision focused on papers where their expertise was a good match. And next slide, please. You can of course go back through any of these later if you want to, or of course, this is also on our main website. Uh, second page of external review committee and there were so many they didn't even fit on two pages. So next slide, please. And uh, you'll see a few ad hoc external reviewers here. I was quite pleasantly surprised uh, after the balancing act of trying to pick the right PC and ERC to cover all the topics we're likely to see. Only about 15% of papers needed us to, to go out for ad hoc external reviews. So that, that was a great outcome from my perspective. All right, next slide, please. We did also award uh, distinguished paper awards. I announced that on Clouder a little earlier and they appeared in our, our main website. Uh, the, the point of these awards is to let the broader community outside just the ICFP world know we have great things going on. If you'd like a sampling of uh, where to focus if you only have limited time to peek in, here are a few that we recommend. And we followed the process of having our reviewers nominate candidate papers that they thought were among the best. And then a, a committee of distinguished paper reviewers shown at the bottom, narrowed this down to the four winners that were announced previously. And I will now also celebrate them on the next slide, please. Congratulations again, authors of all these papers. Uh, three of them have been presented already and one is coming later today. All right, next slide, please. Uh, I have some standard kind of graphs here ICFP this year in numbers, you can see our number of submitted papers was a little bit lower than the last previous last few years. Uh, acceptance rate, number of accepted papers are, are pretty close to the, the norm established over the last few years. Who knows exactly why it was a little lower this year. The world was getting pretty interesting at the moment when the deadline popped up. Next slide, please. Breakdown of authors by country, probably overweighting US because everyone with the .com email address, et cetera, got, got lumped in there. But we can see some of the usual suspects here, a lot of Europe activity in the left-hand side of this distribution. And next slide, please. Uh, counting the number of authors per paper, two and three seem to be the, the overwhelmingly most popular number of authors. So one and four aren't doing so bad. 
And next slide, please. Here are the most popular topics in terms of numbers of submissions. Uh, you can peruse this at your leisure. Let's go to the next slide. Topics with highest acceptance rates. As usual, it looks like it's not a bad strategy to send your imperative programming papers to, to ICFP. You might glean a few other trends in here. And next slide, please. Uh, one experiment we're running this year, which already took place, I think pretty successfully, we are trying out a collaboration with the Journal of Functional Programming to allow authors of recently accepted papers there to present in a special session at ICFP. Authors of eight papers expressed interest in this experiment. We were able to accommodate all of them. That was the, the first main technical session yesterday. Uh, the organizers of both ICFP and co-editors co in chief of Journal of Functional Programming, I'm sure we'll be glad to hear your thoughts on how that went and how that practice might be changed in the future. All right, next slide, please. Uh, here I'm placing in some slides by the people who ran our artifact evaluation process. What is artifact evaluation? It's basically an additional reviewing process that looks at your actual code and other artifacts to check whether they provide a good foundation for other people to re reproduce and build on your work later. So there was a separate process of submitting code and review by a different committee. Next slide, please. Here's that committee. You can also see the co-chairs there in the middle of the left column, Ben Lipmeyer, Brent Yorgi, uh, put in a lot of time making all this work, as well as quite a few reviewers, as you see here. Next slide, please. So, about half of the accepted papers, 21, generated artifact submissions. Each of these submissions was uh, reviewed by at least three people. And in contrast to many review processes, this was more interactive. You can imagine if someone finds they can't quite get your code to build, it's a bummer if you just have to fail that artifact. Instead, we can have some like GitHub issue style communication with the authors and get the minor issues resolved so we can get down to the business of really evaluating whether these systems meet expectations are good foundations for, for follow on work. And next slide, please, drum roll, drum roll. All 21 submissions, we're glad to report, uh, met these standards, which we believe is a result of several years of experience in ICFP setting clear guidelines and uh, also figuring out this interactive process so that small issues don't derail the reviewing. So we were glad that that worked out. And next slide, please. Okay, so this is the key point where we, we switch from business as usual to things are really getting interesting. Uh, we, we realized we would have to run a virtual conference as, as the world changed. So naturally the first step to take is a meta level strategy. Let's form a committee to think about this problem. Shown here are the, the six members of that committee. We had a lot of, of calls and deliberations and, and planning and all sorts of, of forums to try to figure out how this was going to work. So a big thanks to this set of people. Next slide, please. Let me try to explain a bit about our thought process behind some of the ways that the main conference is working. Since there are definitely pros and cons to the old way, the new way, all sorts of other alternatives, I'd like to structure this as a sort of quasi-equational derivation, starting from the spec of ICFP, which is it needs to be some events happening synchronously and some people who are going to attend them. Next slide, please. Key thing about those people, and what's different this year, people are not volunteering to get in big metal machines and travel to the same place and make jokes about jet lag. Instead, we're gonna stay where we are and make jokes about Zoom. And that really influences how all of this can, can be set up. So we have to assume participation across many different time zones. That was a big design consideration here. Next slide, please. So what we decided to do is split our synchronous events between a New York time band designed to follow roughly the hours we would have followed in person and an Asia time band basically chosen to be hours serving people who are far enough away from the first one that it just wouldn't work well for them. And we try to duplicate events like the main research paper talks between these two bands wherever possible. Next slide, please. So for each band, we decided it needed to be only about eight hours a day, including the social events. So usually there'd be a reception uh, after the main action of the day, but we realized we need to include that sort of thing in our budget. We think the social interaction is so important that we, we opted to really lean on the, the unstructured social time in allocating our, our sparse budget of time which unfortunately means a little less time for, for talks, but we found some creative ways to mitigate that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but what, so really, since there are those costs, why was it worth doing this? One, we wanted to focus on a sweet spot band of times that should work for large swaths of our community. The great majority of people who, who attend ICFP, 
And also all of us have been on so many video calls in the last few months, we know it's easy to get tired. So we didn't want to push our luck scheduling events over too long of a time period. So that's why we thought it was really worth compressing. Next slide, please. So the talks were all done as pre-recorded videos. That's a, a first for ICFP. Uh, next slide, please. The key advantage though, logistically for that is that we were able to edit together one video per session in advance and not have to worry about streaming from bandwidth constrained student volunteer laptops during the actual conference. We, we actually were able to upload these to YouTube in advance with preset starting times. And then we have this separate sync, uh, overlapping Q&A thing I'll talk about shortly. Uh, next slide, please. I also polled authors on their time availability. It didn't seem safe to just make up a schedule and let people know if it worked for them or not, because not only would I need to take into account people's time zones, but also who likes to wake up early, who likes to stay up late, who has a meeting at this time, because they're not actually going to step away from their full normal life for a conference when it's virtual. So instead, I made a menu of times and sent people to a web form where they could enter exactly when they're available. And then we could solve a combinatorial optimization problem to come up with a good schedule of the talks, which in this case was trying to keep the same schedule between New York and Asia, which made this uh, interesting in a, a way that I haven't experienced in, in prior scheduling problems. And then next slide, please. And finally, we have this element of having longer Q&A than usual, more in-depth Q&A than usual, but overlapping other talks. This was really at some level forced on us by the small number of hours we have each day but still wanting to let this, this crucial Q&A activity go on. Uh, but I, I think I've heard a lot of good things about people appreciating the, the longer, more in-depth discussions. Of, co of course, it's a trade-off with, with shorter talks, but the talks would have been even shorter if we had traditional Q&A that was in line, couldn't have been more than, than three minutes or so with our other time constraints. So allowing up to half an hour per paper, seems like it's been a pretty successful experiment, at least really influencing our, our brainstorming on, on what's possible in future years where there might be virtual components like this. All right, so I hope this derivation was a little helpful in backtracing how we came to the somewhat unusual layout of this year's conference. Next slide, please. Making all that work was crucially dependent on this, this software system called Clouder, uh, developed by Jonathan Bell, Krista Lopez, and Benjamin Pierce. The first line of code on this thing was written amazingly recently. And then just look at how, how well it's working in driving the conference now. So we, we definitely would give a big round of applause for this set of people if we were in person, ironically given the subject matter. Of course, we're not in person, but hey, they deserve it. Uh, and it'll, it's open source, it'll continue evolving and I'm sure they'd be glad to have your pull requests and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, we needed to rely on the advice and support of quite a few people getting this unusual kind of conference in shape. So here's our ICFP steering committee. Thank you very much to all of these people. Uh, next slide, please. We also had connections to two different journals for ICFP this year, both PAC and PL and the Journal of Functional Programming. So thank you to all of our contact people there. And next slide, please. And then probably the biggest thanks are, are due to the people on, on this slide, organizing committee, uh, some of whom joined relatively recently as we realized new roles were required, but many of whom signed on for, let's say 2019 job descriptions and then suddenly found themselves in mid to late 2020 job descriptions doing quite different things. Uh, I'd especially like to call out a few people here like the industrial relations chair and accessibility chair, Alan and Lindsay, who you may not know have been uh, editing caption files behind the scenes to correct all of the technical terms that our professional captioners creating the videos that you're seeing weren't able to decipher. Um, our student volunteers, I don't think you've seen them in as direct a way as usual. You might not realize all the work they're doing. I'd like to mention, uh, for instance, Hanali, one of the, the organizers of the student volunteers has done a lot of coordination across the, the, the group, figuring out who should do what, who's available when. Uh, Victor Landvin filled in at the last minute in uh, being our video editor, doing a great job putting together the, the session videos. And of course, I have to call out Stephanie Wyrick, the general chair, who has taken on a much bigger job than she realized, did, did a, a great job at it. And in fact, we don't have enough time to tell you all the logistical issues and rationale behind them that I've only touched the surface of. But Stephanie is planning to coordinate the writing of a, a report on this whole virtual conference experience, which you'll be able to access over the, the coming months in which we hope informs future conferences, not just ICFP, but elsewhere in SIGPLAN and beyond. And I believe that is all I have to say.
Okay, uh, thank you, Adam, again. So again, at this point, I'd really love to have the whole room clapping and thanking you so much for all of your efforts, both the usual efforts that go into being a program chair and all of your sort of second shift job that you had to take on as a member of the virtualization committee and pulling through to help us make sure that we could have an online event for ICFP 2020. So thank you, Adam, thank you so much. My pleasure, it was a mind expanding experience. Okay, so for the last part of this session is we have an announcement about ICFP 2021. Hi everyone, it is my great pleasure to tell you about ICFP 2021. I am Seogyeong Ryu from KAIST, the general chair of ICFP 2021. And our program chair is Ron Garcia from University of British Columbia. Next, please. ICFP 2021 was originally planned to take place in Daejeon, South Korea. The venue would be KAIST, and the dates are from August 22nd to August 27th. However, who knows what's going to happen next year? So we sincerely hope for the best, but we'll be well prepared to have yet another virtual ICFP as well. So um, speaking of the venue, it's in South Korea. Daejeon is a one hour train away from Gangnam in Seoul. Next, please. So KAIST has a safe and clean campus. It is in a really quiet and peaceful environment. We have several options for accommodation. Lotte City Hotel and Hotel ICC are decent ones. Toyoko Inn is a reasonable option and students can use KAIST dorms as well. Next, please. And major attractions of Daejeon include Gaedong Mountain, water sports available 10 minutes away from KAIST, and a guided tour to Seoul before or after the conference. Next, please. And here are important dates that you can check out right now from our brand new website, icfp21.sicplan.org. Next, please. Finally, that's me and Ron in that Gaedong Mountain when Ron visited us back in 2017. We had a real fun, not only in the mountain, but also with my students. I know this year has been tough for everyone. Everyone is in a different situation with different difficulties, but for sure COVID-19 is a disaster for all of us. No matter whether we have ICFP 2021 at this beautiful KAIST in Daejeon, or we have yet another virtual conference, the general chair and the program chair of ICFP 2021 will do our best to make this conference fun and exciting. Thank you and see you next year. Okay, thank you, Sukyong. And at this point, I definitely want to give you a big round of applause for all you have done for ICFP 2020 so far. Uh, thanks to you, we've been able to do the Asia Mirror and broaden the reach of ICFP, not just for people who can attend events in the New York time zone, but throughout the entire world. And this is entirely due to you and your team in Korea. So thank you for 2020. And also a <laughs> thank you in advance for all that you will be doing in 2021. You don't have an easy year ahead of you. I'm sure you know this already, but I'm very grateful that you are taking it on. And I'm very confident that 2021 will be in excellent hands. So thank you so much, Sukyang. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Okay, so this is the end of the awards and report session. Adam and I are going to jump over next to the information desk. If anybody has any questions about the reports that you just saw, you can ask them there. I think we're happy to have some of the other people who gave reports join as well if they, they're interested. Yes, um, so I and several others will be in the information desk. We have a short break now. So we have a half hour coffee break so as always, interact in the people, places, in the Clouder chat room, or join us in the information desk. Next, in half an hour, we'll get started again with ICFP session five. Thank you.